Hi everyone, my name is Matthew Rocklin. Uh, I'm an open source software developer. I work on a particular library for parallelism called Dask. Uh, if you were in the last section, you maybe heard about that. Okay, I'll try it again. How's this? Great. Uh, this tutorial was originally built with a few different library developers that work on different parallel programming libraries. And the intention was to talk about parallelism in general so that people can have a better understanding about how to choose sort of the right framework for their computation and about how to reason about parallel computing generally. So it's not about any particular tool, it's about sort of a variety of tools and more generally about how to think about parallel programming. Um, so if you came here looking for a DAS tutorial, that's not it. We're going to use mostly mundane technologies. There are a few web pages you should know. First, there is this GitHub repository, which has uh, some materials, some notebooks, also some installation instructions. Inside those instructions, it says to download Anaconda. Please do not do that. Uh, we've noticed that there's relatively low bandwidth uh, in this, this room. So if you need to download Conda, download mini Conda instead. Uh, or we actually have a cluster set up for you with everything you need. So you can do that too. But some people like to play along, they like to have everything on their local laptop, just so when they walk out of this room, they're still well served. Uh, so you can do that, you can follow these instructions uh, on how to um, Conda install things. If you don't use Conda, you can try using pip as well, um, or you can download mini Conda, which is a small Conda installation. Um, if you wanna test things, there's libraries that should be working. Um, then great. So the other web page you should be aware of is uh, I'm trying to get a better name for this, but bigfatintegral.net. Uh, we'd like to get this under a better domain. But if you press this button, uh, it will launch for you a four-node cluster on Google Compute Engine. This will have all the libraries you need, all the data sets you need. It'll have Spark running. It'll have Dask running. It'll have Akbath in parallel running. Uh, and so if you don't want to install stuff locally, or if there's, say, low bandwidth, you can just click that button at bigfatintegral.net. That link is also inside the chat room. The chat room is here, gitter.im slash dask slash pydata-dc-2016. And that has all the links I've just mentioned, except for itself, because that'd be sort of silly. Okay, within, so either you've started up a Jupyter Notebook server on a local machine, or you are clicking that button, and there are a few different places you can go. You want to go to the directory named pydataDC2016. That'll have a sequence of notebooks that we're going to run through. I'm going to go through the first three, and Aaron will go through the last three. Uh, mine are sort of generally about how to think about parallel programming, and Aaron's are about actual problems. So um, we're going to wait a few minutes. We'll get set up on that. If you have questions, please wave your hands wildly ask questions on the Gitter chat, or if you're totally fine, ask your neighbors if they need help, and maybe you'll also go onto Gitter chat. Um, so we're gonna come back in around five minutes, make sure everything's okay. Okay, so some additional administrative notes. There's a few different wireless networks that are available to you. One is guest BYOD, which I hear is fairly terrible. Uh, there's another one, C1 coders, which is better, but has a password. Um, that password is unhelpfully in the Gitter chat. Um, so if you have a friend nearby who does have internet access, you should uh, ask them for that password. Uh, and then also, if you're a Capital One employee using your own internet, lucky you, you actually can't access this cluster. Uh, it's not using HTTPS. Okay. No. Capital One employees, you should listen to Aaron. Okay, I'm gonna start uh, going now. You can feel free to ignore me. I'm gonna talk for around 10 minutes. There's gonna be exercises. We're gonna swap between slides and explanation and exercises. I'm always going to sit down, unfortunately, because the sort of the mics are set up. So we're going to talk about a few different things. Uh, in the first section, we're talking about uh, three different ways of thinking about parallel computing. First, parallel map, which is just applying one function to lots of things. 
Uh, this is a pretty common case. I'll have files. I want to analyze them all. Uh, option two is submit, which is sort of fully free, lots of parallelism, however you want to set it up. And then three is sort of big collections, uh, things like Spark or MapReduce or Dask that give you, you know, a few big operations you can use, uh, and you can sort of rewrite your combination in terms of that. So we're going to go through those three things in hopefully the next 30 or 40 minutes. Uh, this tutorial was originally a three hour long tutorial uh, presented at SciPy this year. So if you were to go home and want to look at the full thing, you can go on YouTube. Uh, it was presented with uh, Ben Zaitlin, who's online on Gitter, helping us out. It's the person who built the cluster for you. Uh, and then Reagan Kelly of Jupyter. Uh, so props go to them. So uh, first bit, our first three notebooks uh, were map, submit, and collections. Uh, so map, uh, we often have code that looks like this. We have some list of inputs. You want to apply some function onto all those inputs and produce a list of outputs. This might be a bunch of log files I want to parse. It might be a bunch of CSV files I want to do some pandas code on, etc. We might use this comprehension instead, or if we're sort of cool, we might use this map function, uh, which some people in Python use, some people don't. Uh, the map function is interesting because we can redefine this map function and make it a parallel map. So most parallel frameworks all parallel frameworks pretty much include some sort of map function. So things like concurrent futures or thread pools, things like Spark, right, Python Parallel, or Dask, things like Joblib. Uh, okay. So generally how this works is that we import some library, we create some object, and that object has its own map. And so we replace, instead of the pure Python map, we replace it with you know, our library, where this might be you know, some Spark cluster, it might be some thread pool, it might be something else. Okay, so the first notebook we have uh, is uh, on the topic of map. And this is sort of the very common case. Okay. Uh, just a show of hands, who here has used some parallel library to map over a function over data in parallel using map? Okay, it's around 20% of the room. Uh, how about something more complex than map? Okay, maybe about 10% of the room. Okay. This, is a, this is a pretty common case. This is a good tool to have in your belt. This solves, honestly, like 80% of parallel programming problems. If you want to use all your, all your computer, you want to use a big cluster, this solves most of them. Okay. So uh, before we start, we're going to generate some data. So we have some fake stock data. It's around you know, two megabytes of historical daily average data. And we're actually going to be generating uh, this on like a 10 second interval basis. It'll look like real data, but it's definitely fake. Uh, so there we go. Uh, it's you know, doing a bunch of work. This is all happening in parallel, if you're interested in. What this is producing, this is producing uh, a directory with a bunch of data for us, both in CSV format and in JSON format. So the data set we're going to be working with for the first two notebooks, the first three notebooks. From a local machine, you've downloaded like two megs of data and it's now expanding out to like an uncomfortable gigabyte. Okay, so I have a bunch of file names, a bunch of files of JSON data. Okay. And so these are all for a bunch of different stocks. So, you know, Apple is in here, you know, Amgen, etc. And what I want to do is I want to, oh, let's increase the size here. And what we're going to do in this first example is we're going to uh, load up each file, read it in as JSON, turn it into a pandas data frame, and then write it out as, a, as an HDF5 file. And what this is doing is just changing the data format. JSON is really slow to work with, and HDF5 is really fast. So after we do this step, that's interesting. Uh, after we do this step, uh, everyone uh, all of our future companies will be faster. Okay, so this is run sequentially, right? We see it processing through this data set one file at a time. I'm just using a for loop. This is the kind of code we'd like to accelerate. While it does that, uh, let me this from all files. Yeah. Uh, while it does that, we're going to look at some other options. So as we saw, we, there's a few different kinds of writing the sort of uh, we call this embarrassingly parallel. Computations that are sort of do this computation many, many times. As usual ways of writing that, one, we can use map. And when we use something like map, 
we often need to take whatever we're doing inside the for loop and bring it out as a separate function. So in this example, all of this code in the for loop, in the body of the for loop, we need to make that into a single function that we can call over each element in our data set. After we pull that data, after pull that code out into a separate function, we can use map and we can use parallelism. Okay, so that took a while. We should sort of get the feeling that that was, that was somewhat painful. So as an example, let's look at a, a much simpler code. So how it's gonna work, we're gonna present a complex real world example. We're gonna switch to a toy example, have an exercise, a short exercise to solve that, that toy problem. We're gonna use that same approach to solve the real world problem. So here's our toy problem. We're calling sleep uh, eight times, one after another. And what we wanna do is we wanna to call that in parallel. So. We're gonna take the body of this code, which does two things. One, it sleeps, and then two, it adds one to some input. And we're turning that into a function. So, this is concerning. Um, and so hopefully the body of this for loop, which took eight seconds, and this function should look similar to you. We've pulled the body out into a separate function so that now we can create a process pool executor, which is something from the concurrent futures module, which is available in sort of this, it's in the standard library. And then rather than call it in a for loop, we're gonna use that object's map function. So we have this function, we have a list of inputs, just range eight, and we're gonna call a map on those. And so we're still calling that function eight times, but we're calling it in parallel, with a bunch of cores. This machine has, I think, like 16 cores on it. And so it ran in about a second. It ran all of them at the same time. Okay. So there were two steps. One, we made a process pool executor, something you can copy paste. And then two, we took the body of this for loop and made it into a separate function. Then we called map on that function and that list of inputs. Okay. So back to our original example, we have our sequential code, which takes a while to run. Now we want to just parallelize this. So we want to pull out the body of this function. It'll probably take, you know, a file name as an input, and we're going to create a process pool executor, and then call map of that function on all of our file names. Okay, that's our first exercise. Let's try that for a bit. And if you have questions, raise questions on Gitter chat or wave, wave, wave your hands, and we'll come by and help out. Okay, I'm gonna keep moving along. Uh, there's a fair amount of material to cover here, so some of this might be abbreviated. So we can run that sequentially, or we can, so also all the solutions are already present here. So I get the impression that someone else is on this cluster, which is confusing. Just, just start a new one. Yeah. Is that what you're doing? Yeah. So, uh, your clusters are all built with, with Kubernetes. So on Google Compute Engine, there's a system that can like spawn up all of what you want uh, when you click that button, which is, is neat. Uh, and so we should all be entirely isolated, but getting this weird. Okay, great. So here's a solution. So we took the body of the for loop out, made it a separate function, this function, which takes in one of the file names. We also created a process pool executor. Then we're just mapping that function across all the different file names. So we can go ahead and we can, we can time how long this takes. And this is gonna run in parallel using all the cores on my machine and it took two seconds, which is a lot faster than what we saw previously. Uh, this is again the common case. Most parallel computing problems sort of fall under this pattern. I've got all this data. I have this function I wanna run, run on top of all that data, go. Um, many frameworks implement some sort of map. Here we're using concurrent features, but again, most parallel computing frameworks implement some sort of map. Okay. Um, parallelism isn't everything. Uh, this competition can be equally well accelerated just by using a faster JSON library. 
So just a, a quick reminder that you know parallelism can solve your problems, but also just being a slightly smarter about libraries you use or about your algorithms can help just as much with much less pain. Okay, so that's map. Again, common case, fairly useful. Sometimes you have computations that are clearly parallelizable, but don't fit into this sort of standard map paradigm. For example, I have this nested for loops uh, where I'm sort of looking, I'm iterating over two collections, I'm then comparing the elements within those collections, and depending on if it's, you know, one is greater than the other, I'm calling F or I'm calling G. So there's a bit more logic here, right? It's not just map. And it's sort of, it's tricky to think about how I might, you know, write this code using one of these higher level frameworks. In these cases, it's nice to have a fallback, something that I can use to do parallelism without um, needing to use a big operation like a map or a group by. So for that, there's something called submit inside that same concurrent futures library. Submit is also, this, this interface is also implemented inside of things like concurrent futures or Dask, right Python parallel or multiprocessing. And that lets us uh, do parallel computing on sort of arbitrarily structured computations. Uh, so it's nice when sort of you have obvious parallelism, but it's not clear how to write that parallelism in terms of a framework. So how submit works is that we're gonna have some sort of system we build like a concurrent futures executor. And we're going to submit one function on top of some arguments. And this is just a single function call happening in some other process or in some other thread or on, or on some other computer. And I can call that many, many times. And rather than that running the function immediately and then blocking, it gives me some sort of future, some sort of promise that I can use to get the result when it's finished. Later on, I can call result on that future to wait until that result actually finishes. In the meantime, I can do lots of other stuff. For example, I can call submit many, many times. So here's one way in which you could implement map using submit. Submit is sort of a fine-grained version. So here I'm submitting a function on many elements of, a, of an input list and appending all of those features to some list. This happens more or less immediately. And then while we're sort of doing other things, maybe we're checking your email, maybe we're like plotting something, all of some other resources computing those functions for us. And then they come back when we call result. Okay. So our previous example of this code that was clearly had implicit parallelism, but wasn't clear how to use map, we can, every time we wanted to call a function like f, we can replace it with a call to submit where submit takes as its first argument the function we wanted to call, and as the rest of the arguments, the arguments that we would have given to that function. So it's kind of like we're just moving this parenthesis over here to the left of f. So this code starts everything running in parallel, and then we need to call result on all of our futures to actually wait for them to finish. So uh, submit is a pretty powerful tool. Uh, you can do it to sort of anything you want to get parallelism out, uh, and it sort of handles that for you. So it's good in cases where map doesn't fit. Any quick questions on that? If you have, if you have a question, probably tell people that also have that question. So I would love to have one person ask a question. Yes? Yeah, so the question is, is this always forking memory? So I've got a lot of data inside my notebook session. Is that going to cause problems? And the answer is that, so first, submit is an, is an abstract API, just like map. So map can be implemented in many different ways. Uh, for example, there's a thread, there's a thread pool executor, which will use, operate in the same thread, the same, same process. And so the interfaces we're showing here, we're going to use concurrent futures to play with them, but they could be implemented in many different ways. We don't really know how, we don't really care. It's sort of up to the library framework to take care of it. In practice, you don't need to worry. It's going to be fine. Um, if you're using the process pool executor, which is what we'll use in a moment, uh, it will it'll fork, but that'll be probably copy on write. So you'll be, you'll be fine. It will be moving stuff over, over a wire uh, for your data inputs, but don't worry about it. In practice, don't worry about it. It'll be fine. Okay. As 
Yeah, so the second question, uh, submit, like, triggers computation immediately, right? The answer is, again, it depends on the framework implementing it. Uh, thread pool executor, puzzle pool executor have a queue of work, so it'll, you know, it's going to do eight things at once, and it'll put that onto the queue. But let's move on to uh, the second notebook, this submit notebook. Okay, so we have the same data set here, but now conveniently built as HDF5 files from the last exercise. If you didn't finish the last exercise, just load the solution cell and then run that. It'll create all of this for you. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to read in from this, these HDF5 files uh, the closing price for the data set. Let's just look at the status set just for a moment. So let's look at series of, I think, Apple. Okay, so this is the closing price of Apple stock uh, over lots of time. So we have inside of this dictionary the uh, closing prices, a lot of stocks, a lot of maybe, maybe similar stocks, maybe dissimilar stocks uh, over a span of time. And something you often want to do with this sort of data is you want to see how well they're correlated or maybe find a couple of companies that seem to be correlated very strongly. So in the future, maybe if one goes up, you would maybe you know, invest more in the other one. So one thing I might want to do is I might want to find the two stocks that are the most correlated. So here I'm going to do a few things. I'm going to, again, in a sort of sequential code here, this is the thing we're going to parallelize in a bit. We're going to iterate over all the file names twice. And if they are not the same, we're going to uh, compute the correlation of one series with the other. This is using the pandas correlation method. There's a bunch. It'll take a little bit of time. Not too long, but, you know, one and a half seconds. Uh, and this, this code is, you know, parallelizable, but it would be tricky to do with map. So instead, we're going to use the same trick we did with submit to, to parallelize this code. So you're seeing something like correlation, you now need to write a function and then submit that function. Um, work. Let's this thing. Okay. So it looks like there are two uh, stocks that are pretty well correlated. You can see their sort of correlation here. So we want to sort of find these stocks. Okay. So again, our computation starts out embarrassingly parallel. This is something we could do easily with map. We're loading in data from HDF5 file, many HDF5 files. Then the doubly nested loop with an if statement inside of it. This is maybe harder to use map for. There's more complexity here. And then finally, there's a reduction on all of our uh, correlations to find the best one. And this is something that is just not very parallelizable. It's not a, it also isn't very, uh, it isn't very slow. So we don't, we don't really need to parallelize this. The thing we're going to work on is this middle part, which is maybe the, the hard part. So this submit function, if we have a function like slow add, which waits for some time, about a second, and then returns the sum of two numbers, we can call that normally, or we can call it with submit. And you may notice that this ran instantly, right? It immediately returned, and the state of that future was running. Uh, but now, asynchronously, that computation is finished. So it's running in a separate thread somewhere. Okay. And if you want to, we can get the result back. Three. Okay. So this is concurrent futures with submit, which is a handy uh, interface to have. So we did this just with one single computation, but we could have done this many, many, many times. For example, we can call slow add here in a list comprehension, just normally, on 10 numbers, and that's going to take roughly 10 seconds, because it's going to delay one second for every slow add call. Or in the second cell, we can uh, submit slow add get back 10 futures. This line will finish you know, within a couple milliseconds. Then we're going to wait until we have all the results back. And that'll take however long we need it to take. Uh, this machine has, I think, a, number of, a fair number of cores, 
oh, we started a thread pool executor with, I think, four, four threads. And so it looks like you know, it did four of the calls, it did four more calls, and did two more calls. And so it took three seconds total. That's a great question, Aaron. So Aaron's question is, you know, so I sort of, okay, I want to call this thing. I want to call slow out and one and one. Uh, so I, I normally in Python, I, I say the function name, I put a parenthesis, I put in some arguments, I put a closing parenthesis. Thing is, if I do that right now, it's going to call that function. And submit will never actually get access to, to run that instead. So we, we can't just call that immediately. That will instead trigger computation inside of our local thread, which is bad. We won't get any parallelism. So we need to sort of do this trick where we instead give submit the function we want to call, and then separately all the arguments we want to call it with. And then it's going to do the actual uh, calling of things on its own somewhere, inside some other thread, inside some other process, on some other machine. So a common mistake, though, is to do what Aaron was just talking about, which is to actually call slow add in here. You can't do that. That's a common mistake. Second. Yeah. So right. So if we were to uh, do this, slow add is going to run, and it's going to produce two, and then we're going to call e dot submit on two, which is not going to be of much use. So yeah, that's a great great explanation. Okay. So we always put in the function, and then the arguments, and then the keyword arguments if we need to, but we never actually call the function immediately. Okay, so exercise. We have a couple of different functions here, slow add and slow sub. And we have some sequential code. And we need to use submit inside of the sequential code to instead produce not a list of results, but a list of futures. Okay, this is gonna be very similar to um, the code we were doing up here. But now it's something that you have to do in a small exercise. Uh, if you need to, there's solutions on here. So let's spend a few minutes on that. If you finish early, uh, your actual full exercise is down here, and it's mostly the same thing, but this time on actual data. So let's spend a few minutes and work on this, this exercise, uh, and I'll be back, back in a bit. Okay, I'm gonna move on. So here's my solution to that problem. So we're gonna submit the functions slow add and slow sub rather than call them directly, into a list of futures. And so each of these objects, so here's submit returns for us some object, uh, a future object, which is uh, something we can use to get the actual result when it's finished. And so futures is a list of these, so this futures list here, is a list of these future objects. And this code finishes immediately and gives us this list. Now what actually happened? Right, so we're using the thread pool executor, and so there's maybe you know four different threads. They're all uh, watching some queue. Whenever we call submit, we're putting a function and some data into that queue, and the threads are pulling from that queue and doing work. When they finish, they put the result onto the future object. And so we can call result on that future object until we wait and get the result. I'll say we can run this, it runs you know, faster than it would have run otherwise. Okay. We can do the same thing with our actual computation. So here, this ran in about one and a half seconds. For our solution, we're going to, so this one is a little bit tricky, right? Because we had this method here. We don't really know how to submit methods. That's a little bit, little bit more awkward. So instead, we, we make a little function correlation function, which takes in two inputs and calls the correlation method on them. It's the same exact pattern. If we run it, it ran in about you know, half the time. Um, this actually wasn't a whole lot faster, right? This was maybe twice as fast and not you know, four times or 10 times as fast. 
And this computation, this correlation computation, uh, isn't very it isn't uh, very computationally intense. So it does, it's not easy to make it fast. So it's worth noting that a lot of parallel computing really just helps you with uh, you know, using multiple, multiple CPUs. But that might not be your, your bottleneck. It might be bottlenecked on disk inner on disk I/O, on the network, on memory, on other things. Uh, someone else in the corner also asked, "Hey, you know, your th correlation is symmetric, right? So it'd actually be a lot faster if you were to just only consider uh, half of these pairs. Uh, so we don't need to consider A and B, and then B and then A. The correlation will be the same. We just need to consider, you know, one one of those pairs. And so we could have gotten the same speed up uh, just by being a little bit smarter about our problem. And then we didn't have to think about futures or threads or anything. We could have just been a little bit smarter. So again." Always think about your competition before you paralyze. Um, as an exercise, uh, there's threads and processes. Uh, a good rule of thumb is if you're using NumPy, Pandas, Scikit-Learn, Numba, any sort of Scythonized code, you should be using threads. Uh, this reduces memory, um, moving data between processes, which is expensive. And Python is very good at parallelism for numeric code and threads. If you're using Python code, pure Python code, like dictionaries and lists and sets, you might want to use processes. This is because of the gil. You can sort of look online about why that is. But NumPy pandas threads, pure Python processes. Uh, you can break this in fun ways. OK. Um, so that's submit. And again, submit is good for sort of unstructured computation. There's a middle ground, which is sort of big collections. So things like Spark RDDs or Dask data frames or bags or arrays, where you have some large abstraction, like all of my data is a big table, or is a big array, or is a big list. Uh, and then you are restricted to a few operations, things like group by or shuffle or map or filter, and you construct your computation with those big operations. And that framework provides for you a few things you can do that are safe, and everything else is sort of not safe. Uh, so. If you can sort of rewrite your computation in a few of these sort of patterns, uh, some of these sort of semi-structured collections might be a good choice. So there's sort of a middle ground between map, which was just one pattern and fully, fully sort of restrictive. You do one thing. Submit, which is you know, sort of anything you want to do, you can do. Uh, and the sort of middle ground of you have a few different operations you can use, and you try to compose your, your algorithm in terms of those operations. So this works in lots of cases, like for you know, SQL databases or for data frames, if your, data, if your computation fits inside of that mold. Um, we're running a little bit low on time. Uh, so the next exercise, you can do with either Spark or, or Dask. It'll look mostly the same. I'm gonna use, I work on Dask, so I'm going to use Spark just to be sort of egalitarian. Um, but there's like a one word difference inside of these two. So we have this, the same sequential code from before, where we are um, uh, let's, that a bit. And let's make a copy. So we have the same code from before, and we can think about some of some of the Spark operations like map, or Cartesian product, or filter, um, or max, and we can think about how to rewrite our for loops in terms of those operations. So um, just to give sort of a, a, a brief example of how that works. So I'm making a little Spark context, it takes a few seconds. If I have you know, a Spark RDD, so an RDD is like a parallel collection, it's like a list that is you know, maybe on my machine or maybe on different processes or on different computers. Um, and I can make one by, you know, in a simple sense, by sort of calling this parallelize method. I can gather it back by calling collect. And there's some overhead here, but it's, it's, it's fine. Um, I can do things like map, where I'm going to map a function across all of my data. So previously I had this RDD, now it contains all of my numbers one through five. And I can call map on it, and that gives me another RDD, or I can call map and then collect, and that gives me our results back. Okay. So, just like concurrent futures, Spark also provides this map function. And again, so does like Python Parallel, so does Joblib, so does Dask, lots of things. Filter, I can sort of select a particular elements I want to remove from my collection or keep in my collection. So here I'm selecting only the even elements. 
and Cartesian product is I have this list, one, three, or five, and I'll make a tuple with all possible combinations. So zero, 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 one, zero, two, one, zero, one, 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 two, etc. And so using map and Cartesian uh, and filtering all these other things, we can start to chain these operations together. So here I'm, I'm going to square all my elements. I'm then going to uh, sort of consider the product with my original data set. And then going to filter out the elements where the second one is, is even, and then collect. Okay. And so again, if we can sort of think with these sort of big operations in our heads, so map, Cartesian product, filter, group by, join, then we can use systems like Spark or DAS bag or Spark data frame or DAS data frame. Um, and so now we have this problem. Uh, we need to look at our sequential code, this sort of nest of for loops, this condition, and then applying this function, and then think about how to apply, how to rewrite this in terms of the operations we've just seen. Cartesian product, map, filter, uh, etc. Some sort of pi, pi, pi spark error happening. But, um, okay, so when are we out of here? What's the, uh, trying to figure out a schedule? 12.15? Okay. Um, I want to be able to play with that while Aaron and I switch out, and then Aaron will talk about some other materials too. Um, so I'll give a brief sort of final bit on this bit. So we've seen a few different ways of thinking about parallel computation. We've seen map on one end. We've seen submit on the other end. Map is does, does the common case. It's really good in most of the cases. Submit is completely freeing, and it looks a lot like your Python code. And the sort of middle ground of playing with these sort of libraries that give you a, a fixed set of things you can work with. Uh, and if you're, you know, depending on your problem, you might choose one solution or the other that fits well. All of these kinds of algorithms have been implemented in many different ways. You can use these, all of these on your local computer. You can use all of these on a cluster. So you don't have to choose one or the other based on your hardware. You can choose these based on your computation. It's a good way of thinking about if you've got a given problem, okay, where do I sort of fit? And then I can separately find some tool that matches that algorithm type on my hardware. So if I'm on a single machine, I just want to use map, maybe concurrent futures is enough. Maybe that's good, because it's really simple, it's really easy to use, done. If I want to use a cluster and I want to use submit, um, well, let's see, IPython Parallel does that and Dask does that. So I'm sort of restricted to those two. If I want to use collections, on a single machine, I've got a few options. If I use collections on a cluster, I've also have a few options, things like Spark or Dask. So, so you sort of break companies into those boundaries. Okay, uh, Aaron, do you want to set up while people try out this exercise, uh, rewriting this for loop code uh, using the sort of Spark primitives? And again, if you, if you sort of can't get that, uh, the solution is available. We're going to move forward on to Notebook 4, which is the cross-validated parameter search. Okay, so I'm going to wait for a minute for everybody to get that notebook up, and then I'll start uh, talking. Uh, I think I also need to be speaking into this mic, so I'll have to balance these two. It's, uh, okay, so if you're in the PyData DC 2016 folder, it's going to be numbered four. If somehow you ended up in the other folder, that's okay. The notebooks are the same. Uh, just make sure you're in the cross-validated parameter search notebook. Okay. So uh, go ahead and raise your hand if you've got that notebook up. Raise your hand if you need some more time. Okay. So I'm going to move forward, and I'm going to let uh, Matt and Hussein help out with anybody who still needs some time. Uh, Hussein's joining us. He's already been voluntold. Uh, OK. Cross-validated parameter search. So who here is, uh, does model fitting uh, with scikit-learn? So who here has done a parallel model fit with scikit-learn? Who here has done a parallel model fit with scikit-learn on a cluster with a hyperparameter search? OK. I think I've seen one person. At the end of this exercise, you will all have done a parallel hyperparameter search for a model fit 
on a cluster. Okay, actually you'll have done it on a node, but the steps to go from a node to a cluster in Dask are trivial. So uh, we're gonna talk through this. Uh, go ahead. Do I have a mic? I am mic'd. You know, there's probably just no speakers on that end of the room. So I can switch mics with Matt. <laughs> Let's try this. I can shout, too. Uh, but if I shout, I have to keep turning my head left and right. Uh, do you guys prefer shouting or miking? Okay. Let me just switch mics and see if that works. Am I mic'd on the right side? Yeah. Ironies. Okay. Just to recap what I said for the last two minutes, we're going to do a parallel hyperparameter fit. If you don't know what that is, don't worry about it. It's basically we're going to search over a set of parameters in a model fit to find the best possible one. So this is a task that's trivially parallelizable, and yet we never parallelize it. And so sometimes you'll have vast computing resources available to you and yet you still won't be doing things faster because you haven't been able to parallelize things until now. So here we go. We're going to walk through this. Uh, we're going to start with the problem that you may have seen. Uh, I think for a lot of you this is going to be familiar. This is just the digits data set in scikit-learn. So if you've worked in scikit-learn before, you'll have worked probably with this data set if you've trained a classifier at some point or another. Um, I am waiting for this to execute. Lost the kernel for a moment there, and it's back. Okay, so this is the problem. You have, go ahead. Can you be in the notebooks directory? Because the source model wasn't over. The, okay. So you should not be in PyData DC. You need to go back to the. You go back to the notebooks directory? Yeah. There's a file that we failed to move as we migrating tutorials. It's the cd params demo.py file. Gotcha. That file we didn't move. Okay. Sorry, so Matt just instructed me that I failed to move a uh, file over last night when we were uh, getting this tutorial ready. So uh, the easiest way to do this is to go back up to this cluster controller, um, head to the notebooks directory, and then head to, to number five, cross-validated parameter search. Uh, and I will fix this after the tutorial if you head into this, the correct directory. So just taking a quick look, what we're looking at is a set of data where we have handwritten digits. And we know that we want those digits to go to map from 0 to 9. And so for each of these digits, probably the best guess here is that this was a 0, for example. But we don't want to do this by hand. We want the computer to, to do this for us. So if you step forward, this import should work. If it didn't work, you need to move over to the other no notebook directory. Again, come up to the home, go into the notebooks directory instead of the PyData DC 2016, and then open notebook 5, cross-validated parameter search. Okay. So here's the parameter space. There's uh, a couple of different uh, parameters uh, used in, uh, I believe that this is a support vector classifier. So there's a couple of different parameters that uh, show up in a support vector cl uh, classifier. 
Uh, I believe that C is the penalty parameter, uh, gamma is the kernel coefficient. Uh, this one's actually relatively important. That's the stopping criterion. Um, the default that a library like scikit learn gives you may not actually be suitable for your use case. Right? So you may actually want a model that has a really tight convergence or a really tight uh, attempt at, at error convergence. And so depending on what your criterion, you may need to change this tolerance. So don't just always rely on the defaults. Uh, don't even necessarily rely on what comes out of the hyperparameter space. Take a minute and think about what your actual loss function is and what you're trying to get to. Um, this is a little bit of a preview for a talk that's coming up uh, on Sunday by Chris White. So uh, if you have some more thoughts about that, you can come see him after the talk or you can come go watch his talk in the afternoon. Okay. So uh, obviously when you train a model, you don't want to train on your test data. You split it. Uh, so you have a cross-validation set. Uh, Scikit-learn uh, makes that easy. And what we've done in this CV params demo file is we've done some of the work ahead of time for you in terms of splitting this data set up so that you can work or operate on individual pieces of the cross-validation set. Okay, so we have a, a training set. Uh, and now what we're going to do is we're going to run through this parameter space uh, just sequentially. And did I miss something? Say again? Oh. Oh. That. It's a quick way to not execute things correctly. Okay. So this is a coarse-grained search that we executed in serial. And we're doing it slowly because we're doing it in serial. Uh, we're doing a small coarse search because we're in serial. So the exercise here. So this is just a, a quick plot of uh, the parameter space that we're searching over. So um, you'll find that these uh, in the lower right are the better solutions. But we don't really have a good understanding of what this space looks like. And so we can do a, a much more high resolution parameter search um, if we do it in parallel. So again. This is the, the number that you may want to uh, increase. This is, so this is just a uh, pair of splits, so you could have more splits. Um, and then this is a parameter grid that we have sort of a 10 by 10. Uh, and again, once you have this in parallel, you'll increase this so that you can have a more high resolution search. Um, there's two solutions here that uh, you can look at. Uh, but why don't you start as an exercise now Try and apply all the things that you've learned uh, in the first 45 minutes with Matt. Uh, if you get stuck, you can either talk to a friend, you can raise your hand, or you can look at the solutions files. Um, so there are two solutions that have been uh, saved to you and are already available. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to paste into the Gitter room. with my password. This is a solution that does the hyperparameter search in parallel on the cluster. So I'm going to show you the differences between this solution and the uh, solution one, which is I'll, I'll just load it into another cell so we can look at them next to each other. Oh, it's just the cell above. I see it now. Okay. Okay. So this is the original solution. You all have this in front of you. You can pull up a thread pool executor or a process pool executor. Both would work. Okay. And then here's the work, right? You submit a function that evaluates a single uh, sort of model fit, right? That's what the evaluate one is doing. It's just taking a specific set of parameters and it's trying to fit the model there. And then it's appending that result into the list of futures. And then it's just uh, forcing these results to return. It's going to block on all the results here in this last bit. This is that solution, but now it's been uh, 
we can say Daskified, right? Okay, so instead of using a thread pool executor, we say from Dask distributed import executor. And progress is just a little bit of uh, sugar here that makes it easier to see how things are going and detect if there's a problem. Okay, and of course this code is going to work for you as well because you have if you have a cluster up. Uh, so if you're logged into Big Fat Integral, uh, you'll be able to, to execute this. You set up E equals executor, uh, schedulers 9000. That's just telling the schedulers what port to look for and, and where to go. Okay. This upload file is there because this cvparams demo.py is not on the other cluster nodes. And so one thing that you can do is if you have some data, like some lightweight data, or you have a Python module that you need to ship over, just while you're sort of testing things out, you can actually send this thing up to all of the nodes. This isn't sort of what you would do in production. It's just something that you would do while you're playing around. Okay. And then everything else looks the same. Okay. The code actually hasn't changed. So if you got something in parallel and you tested it out and you were comfortable with the way that it was working, you could actually take this code and then put it on a cluster and run it in parallel and you'll get the speed up from the cluster. Um, and of course, the API is the same. Sometimes things will subtly change and it won't work, uh, but at least you'll be able to write code that looks the same or very familiar and test it out and work on it locally before you go onto a big cluster. Okay. So there's also a Spark solution uh, down at the bottom. I, I'm, I don't know if anybody tried it. Uh, it should work. Okay. Any questions about this before I move on? I know this is, we probably gave this thing not even a tenth of the time it deserves. There's a lot to explore here. Yeah, Dan. Did you have to start something on port 9000, like a separate process? So the processes were already running when the cluster got started. We, we started them up for you. Um, go ahead. Can you increase the number of samples and run that again and plot it just to see what the space actually is Sure. We didn't save it into results, we just uh, kept it here. I got it. Yeah. Oh, I just needed to. Yeah, so this line here, don't worry about it too much. It's just it's just a way it's it's actually almost assumed that the schedulers are going to be running on this port. It's it's just set up for for the Dask parallel cluster. Go ahead. The Dask solution seems to be four times faster. I don't know. He's saying that the Dask solution is four times faster than PySpark. I wouldn't, I wouldn't take those numbers too seriously. Um, we actually get really critical of, of folks who don't benchmark properly. Uh, you're on a cluster with shared tenancy, so I, yes, in this particular case, it probably is faster. Remember that PySpark has to cross the Java Python boundary every time data comes in and out, and that's going to slow it down, especially for sort of smaller workloads where there's a lot of communication versus computation. Um, but yeah, there's no claims about speed of Dask versus PySpark in this tutorial. You can start it with certainly faster. You don't have to start a GDM. So starting a Dask is much quicker. Okay, I'm going to move on before we uh, <laughs> get into dangerous territory. Okay, so uh, the final thing I wanted to show you is uh, distributed data frames. It's number eight in the notebooks. And basically what I'm going to do is just for the next five minutes, I'm going to just talk a little bit about this. The cluster is going to stay up after this tutorial ends and through lunch. So uh, you may need to log in and create a new cluster because I believe they're expiring. They're not expiring after 30 minutes. Okay, keep your, keep your current thing up. Uh, don't listen to me. Um, okay. So 
now we're going to talk about a different type of analysis. What we started before was we already had our data loaded, and what we wanted to do was we wanted to fit a model. Now, as anybody here who have, who's ever worked with a data set can tell you, 90% of the effort is just getting it into memory and in the shape that you want it to be in, right? If it's over a gigabyte or if it's over 10 gigabytes, all of a sudden, all of your standard tricks start getting really painful. So what we're going to show you how to do here is to actually bring data in into a, a pandas-like data frame in Dask. So the tool that we're using is Dask data frame. Uh, it's very similar as well to what Spark's concept of an RDD is, or a, a distributed data frame. Um, but we, to whatever extent possible, use the same interface as Pandas. So there's some things that are going to be missing. You're not going to have everything, but you're going to be able to use a lot of the same ideas. And so if you're just exploring some data or trying to get it you know, from one state into another, this is a really good place to start. So uh, the first thing that we're doing here is we're looking at uh, the New York Taxi Cab data set. Uh, they're stored as a bunch of CSV files on uh, S3. And uh, we see that if we tried to just pull one of these in uh, with pandas, uh, it would be pretty painful. right? So that's not really showing you how hard this is, but this is what the data looks like. So instead, uh, we're going to use a parallel uh, Dask execution context. And we're going to read those CSV files. Uh, again, that read CSV should look familiar. It, it looks like pandas read CSV. Uh, there's one more thing in here, this storage options. Uh, and I'm not going to go into it, but that's uh, a Dask specific uh, keyword for uh, loading parallel data. Okay, So it didn't actually finish loading just in that uh, call. Everything by default in Dask, uh, there's two things. It's lazy and it's non-blocking. So lazy means that it's not going to execute until you tell it to. Non-blocking just means that it's going to come back. A result is going to come back that may not be the result. It just says, oh, I executed this thing. So remember, there's, a, there's actually a difference there. So lazy means that it doesn't start executing until I tell it that I need it. Non-blocking means I'm going to get, I'm, I'm interactive. I'm going to get something back right after I make that function call. So I can go and maybe start doing something else. So for example, if it's lazy, I might say, oh, I actually need you to actually compute this. So there's two ways you can tell Dask to compute. You can say persist, which is do this thing. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I should start this is what you're saying. OK. So, uh, so there's do this thing, and then there's actually I want the result back. And so do this thing is an execution call, but it's not blocking. That's persist. Compute is blocking. It won't come back until it's actually got a result, and then it gives you that result as well. So there's more notes on that in here. Uh, but now uh, you actually have this data frame up. And you'll see this progress is being called every time we're doing an action, just to give you an idea of sort of a sense of how tough some of these computations are to, to compute and how long they're going to take. Um, we can look at, for example, we, we pulled uh, the fares out of the data frame that were positive. That's the the request here. That almost, you know, if you're familiar with SQL but not super familiar with Python or Pandas, this starts looking a little bit, you know, like a SQL-like language that's intentional, right? Pandas data frames are sort of this in-between of arrays or tabular data and SQL-like or database-like access to your data. Okay, um, so we can take a uh, sum of all of the fares where the taxi cab driver got stiffed and he didn't get a tip. Okay, uh, And we can take a look at the total number of fares. And we can take a look at the total number of passengers. Right, So these are just easy reductions over the entire data set. Okay? So it's 12.15. I'm going to turn it over to Matt. I have to run. I've got another uh, thing I've got to run to. It has been awesome. Uh, this has been really fun. Uh, follow up with us. Come to the happy hour tonight. And uh, thanks.
Okay, so I think we're actually at time, right? Tutorial is done now? Right. I'm happy to stick around for questions. People want to ask questions, but now would be a good time to sort of finish up. If people want to leave the room, they can leave the room in a way that's, you know, friendly and happy. So thank you all for coming. Um, I'll give you another talk on Dask on Sunday. Dask is much more than what we've seen here. Um, and generally speaking, this wasn't a Dask talk. This is a general parallel computing talk. So you have to remember that. Uh, please play around with stuff. These clusters will be up for the next you know, day at least. So please play around. It's a nice chance to play with a lot of different tools, have a nice environment that's safe. You can't break anything. Everything's protected. So do whatever you want. Um, and yeah, thank you all for coming.